today we're going to talk to Amy Butler Greenfield, a historian and writer who has a, a wonderful new biography about Elizabeth Smith Friedman. She's a pioneer in cryptology, and Amy is going to tell us all about her background as well as how what she uh, went through in her career and the experiences she had can actually translate into things that many of us may experience over the lifetime of their careers as well. So welcome, Amy, and the chat is all yours. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Christine. I'm delighted to be talking to all of you today about Elizabeth Smith Friedman. Thank you for joining me. As you've just heard, she was one of America's greatest cryptologists. And for decades, hardly anyone knew about her. She was pushed into the shadows of history despite all of her really brilliant achievements. I wanted to help put her back in the spotlight. So I've spent the past few years digging into her story, working with her diaries and letters, with public records, talking to people who knew her, and looking into declassified files. She was a woman of many secrets, and sometimes I felt like I had to become a codebreaker myself, just trying to crack the cryptic messages that she left behind. I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to talk to you today about some of the turning points in her astonishing career and how she handled them. In every life and career, even one as remarkable as Elizabeth Friedman's, you're going to have to make choices, sometimes hard ones. You will hit bumps, you'll hit obstacles, and the strategies that Elizabeth used to overcome these might come in handy for you. Let's look at turning point number one, which is getting an education. It wasn't easy for Elizabeth Smith Friedman to get a good education. She was born in 1892. She was the youngest of nine children, and she grew up on her family's farm outside of Huntington, Indiana. She didn't like to talk much about her upbringing, and this is one of the only images we have of her as a child. She's the tiny child in the front here. She's sickly and small for her age at this time. Back then, nine out of 10 students never even graduated from high school but Elizabeth was aiming at college. Her father didn't approve and he refused to pay a penny toward it. He didn't believe in higher education for women. When Elizabeth graduated from high school in 1910, she told people she was college bound. In reality, she found herself stuck at home. This is a photo of her from around that time. The most exciting thing she got to do that year was play the piano for church socials. She thought it was a lost year. For decades afterwards, she always subtracted exactly one year from her age, as if to say this extra year at home didn't count. But she had the grit to apply to colleges again, and this time she managed to persuade her father to lend her the money to go. He drove a hard bargain, demanding every penny paid back and 6% interest. It took her years to pay it off. And even with that money, she still had to scrimp and save and do lots of odd jobs at college. But to Elizabeth, it seemed like a price worth paying. And she was right, because having a college degree opened up the doors to her future career. But not at first. Which leads us to turning point number two, getting out of the wrong job and into the right one, which is something you probably will have to do at some point. At college, Elizabeth studied English and languages and in 1915, she earned her BA. She also became engaged to a fellow student, a poet named Van Kirk. While he finished his degree, Elizabeth looked for work. Back then, teaching was the main option for female college graduates. That's how it played out for Elizabeth. She took a job here in a high school near her home. Her life seemed set, but not for long. That year, she discovered that she hated teaching. Then her relationship fell apart. She fell into deep despair. She wrote in her diary that she wished passionately day after day to die. Desperate for a fresh start, in 1916, she took a train to Chicago to search for another job, one she'd like more. After pounding the pavement, she stopped at the city's famous Newberry Library, which had a first folio, that is a first edition of Shakespeare's plays printed in 1623. She ended up talking with a the librarian there about Shakespeare. 
Impressed, the librarian said she knew a job that would suit Elizabeth, and she picked up the phone. Minutes later, a huge man with a bellowing voice burst into the room. Before Elizabeth knew what was happening, he swept her out of the library. Then they boarded a train headed for a place called Riverbank. The man's name was George Fabian. You can see him standing here with Elizabeth. He really was huge. He was a millionaire, and Riverbank was his estate. It was a strange place. Chairs, sofas, even beds could be found hanging on chains from the ceilings. A chimpanzee lived on the porch. It was also home to a research center that Fabian himself had founded. His favorite research project was run by a woman named Elizabeth Wells Gallup. She was studying Shakespeare's first folio and the variations in its lettering. You can see examples of those letters here. Gallup believed that the variations were actually a cipher that carried secret messages. She needed a new assistant, and Elizabeth got the job. Here she is with Gallup and Gallup's sister, Kate. Elizabeth is on the left. Elizabeth loved learning more about codes and ciphers. She also really enjoyed life at Riverbank. It included swimming, fine dining, and late night joy rides in a fancy sports car called a Stutz Bearcat. Yet no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't confirm any of the secret messages that Gallup claimed to have found. At first, that made her feel like a failure. Then she began to wonder if maybe Gallup was seeing messages that weren't really there. And that leads us to turning point number three, confronting the boss. At first, Elizabeth kept her doubts about the Shakespeare project to herself. She'd already learned that Fabian had a terrible temper. He didn't like to be crossed. At last, however, she confided in another Riverbank employee, a young scientist named William Friedman. You can see the two of them here on a porch at Riverbank. The more they both learned about cryptography, the more they became convinced there weren't any ciphers in Shakespeare. They believed the larger variations were random, and they were absolutely right about this. But what could they say to Fabian, their boss? If they told him the project was a dud, he might fire them, and they couldn't afford to lose their jobs. They talked about it, then finally decided to confront him anyway. They were right. He was furious. But they didn't lose their jobs. Instead, Fabian decided to move them on to a new project, and this project became their big break. He ordered them to set up a department of ciphers at Riverbank. Then he offered their services to the War Department just as the U.S. entered World War I. At the time, the United States had hardly any good code breakers. So Elizabeth and William ended up leading the country's main U.S.-based code-breaking unit. They were responsible for decrypting secret messages not only for the Army, but the State Department, the Justice Department, the Navy, and even the Post Office. Later in the war, they also created the main code-breaking school for the U.S. Army. And they did all of this from Riverbank. Working as a team, they spent hours together, day after day, tossing suggestions back and forth. After a month of this, they got married. You can see them here on their wedding day in 1917. There was no time for a honeymoon. Instead, they went straight back to work. As a team, they were unstoppable. The two of them could crack almost any message within two hours. Elizabeth loved the moment when the solution emerged. The skeletons of words leap out and make you jump, she wrote. But there was trouble on the horizon. The war that brought them together was about to split them up. In 1918, William was sent to France to serve as a codebreaker near the front lines. Here he is in uniform just before he went overseas. Female codebreakers weren't allowed to serve outside the U.S., so Elizabeth couldn't follow him. Alone at Riverbank, she was harassed by Fabian, who prevented her from getting a codebreaking job elsewhere. She took the only option left to her. She went home to look after her widowed father. By the end of the war, William was seen by the army as a code-breaking genius, and he really was one. Soon he was making breakthroughs that would revolutionize cryptology. Back in Indiana, cooking and scrubbing floors for her father, Elizabeth found herself on a different path. As she later put it, she was beginning to realize what it meant to be a champion swimmer stranded in the Sahara. By the end of the war, she was out of practice, and she was known to almost no one. As you can see, she was overjoyed when William came home from France in 1919. But when it came to code breaking, she was aware she had fallen behind and she didn't see how she could ever catch up 
1920, the War Department offered them both jobs in Washington, D.C., but Elizabeth was hired as William's assistant for half the pay. For her, it was a steep fall from 1918 when they had been equals. The situation Elizabeth found herself in was rooted in discrimination, and back then, there was no legal way for her to fight it. So what did she do next? Now we get to turning point number four, setting your own terms. At first, Elizabeth was tempted to give up. After a year at the War Department, she quit. For the next few years, as William went from strength to strength, Elizabeth had a choppy career path. He constantly encouraged her. He thought she was brilliant and that she deserved more than she was getting. But it was really hard to make that happen. After a career break, she moved to the Navy for a while. Then she took time off to have children. You can see her here with her husband and daughter, Barbara. While she was at home, she undertook some private work and some occasional work for the government. It wasn't a traditional career path, but it did work for her. The short-term jobs helped her brush up her skills. They also gave her a better idea of what kind of work she really enjoyed. While she was good at creating new secret codes, she now knew for sure what she liked best was code breaking. And that helped her be ready when her next big opportunity came along. Pulled her back into full-time code breaking was the rum war. This was Coast Guard's battle to enforce prohibition, the ban on alcohol that started in 1920. Elizabeth wasn't anti-alcohol, but she was shocked by the way the liquor racket was fueling organized crime. Mobsters like Al Capone could make upwards of $50 million a year from illegal alcohol. And that's over $800 million in today's money. Profits like that allow gangsters to run rings around law enforcement, and city after city, violent crime was soaring. The gangsters were determined to sneak alcohol into the United States, and they spared no expense on their rum running boats. You can see one of them here, piled high with huge crates of liquor. The gangsters paid for the best engines, the best captains, and even for the latest and rapid fire weapons. The Coast Guard had only a small rickety fleet. Outmanned and outgunned, their only hope was to outsmart the rum runners by breaking their codes. These codes came in radio messages, which were revealing when and where the illegal cargoes were being transferred and landed. To break them, the Coast Guard needed a top-notch script analyst. They offered the job to Elizabeth. She was interested, but she didn't say yes right away. Instead, she did something very modern, something you might do at some point. She negotiated a good work-life balance. I made the condition that I wouldn't work in an office, she later wrote, if I could take the step home and work on it. All right. It was one of the first times a government employee ever asked for the right to work from home, but it wouldn't be the last. The Coast Guard agreed to her conditions because they wanted Elizabeth for the job, but they wanted her mostly because they believed her famous husband would help her with the work. They had no idea Elizabeth by herself could do the job. So we get to turning point number five, proving yourself. The best way to prove yourself is to get the job done. And that's what Elizabeth did. Over the next three years, working almost entirely on her own, she solved a staggering 12,000 secret messages for the Coast Guard and related U.S. agencies. The impact was immediate. Liquor imports fell sharply. But the gangsters fought back, hiring some of the best cryptographers in the business. At war times, Elizabeth Sauer. By late 1930, Elizabeth estimated that she had seen nearly 50 systems of secret communication. She cracked them all an incredible feat and saw even more challenging ones take their place. Day after day, she grappled with them alone. It was demanding work. At times, it seemed almost impossible, but it was the making of her. Month by month, she honed her talent on these codes and ciphers. Soon, she was no longer just a good code breaker. She was a great one. In the 1930s, when Elizabeth started appearing as an expert witness in trials, she became a code breaking star. She was covered in newspapers across the country in articles like this one. She also single handedly created an entire Coast Guard intelligence unit, training every member herself. She was upping her game in other ways, too, especially when it came to gathering intelligence. The more information she had, the easier it was to decrypt the messages. And by pulling together information from different agencies and locations, she often saw links that no one else did. 
These links helped her break more messages, which she then shared with the agencies that were best placed to act on them. Today, this kind of multi-source, multi-agents, multi-agency intelligence work is common in law enforcement and cybersecurity. Back then, it was new, and Elizabeth was a pioneer. She became an intelligence powerhouse, able to advise the Coast Guard and other agencies on everything from potential dangers to easy targets. Thanks to her, many mobsters ended up behind bars. So let's look at the last turning point, which is getting credit. If Elizabeth was famous, why did the history books end up leaving her out? The short answer is World War II. Elizabeth was a key player in World War II signals intelligence. You can see her working here in 1940. She set up the secret code systems used by the government's first spy agency, the OSS, precursor to the CIA. She helped protect Allied ships from potential Nazi submarine attacks. She also tracked Nazi spy rings in North and South America, which in some cases involved cracking Enigma, a Nazi cipher many thought was unbreakable. But all of this work was done in secret, and she had sworn an oath to keep it secret for life. Like other code breakers, she had been warned that if she said anything, she could be prosecuted under the terms of the Espionage Act. Knowing she could say nothing, other people claimed the credit for what she had done. One of those people was J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. He said it was his bureau that had broken the codes and defeated the Nazi spies. Newspapers across the country covered these stories, and the FBI got all the glory. Another person who claimed credit for her work was her boss. He was put in over her head when the U.S. entered the war, even though he had less experience with code breaking than she did. He believed he held her team back and often wasted their talent. That's how she saw it. But when the war was over, it was her boss who received six honors and medals for the unit's work. Elizabeth received nothing at all. Sworn to secrecy, she couldn't say anything about how unfair this was, not even to her own husband. But it was unfair. So what did she do about it? She did the honorable thing. For her whole life, she kept quiet about her work in World War II. After a while, almost everyone assumed this meant that she hadn't done anything worthwhile, maybe because she wasn't really much of a codebreaker after all. But Elizabeth did something else, something important. She saved what records she could. Some of them, like the records about World War II, went into classified government vaults, and they stayed there for decades until they were finally declassified in the 21st century. Other papers, like her reports for the Coast Guard, were hers to keep. Before she died in 1980, she found a home for them at the Marshall Foundation in Virginia. These records have allowed us nearly a century later to work out the truth. Elizabeth was a patriot and a hero and one of the best code breakers this country has ever produced. If you remember anything about Elizabeth from today's talk, I hope you remember this. When you hit roadblocks in your career or in your life, Keep in mind that others have been here before you, and you can turn to them even when they're no longer here with us for ideas about what to do next. Mentors are everywhere. Like Elizabeth, you can fight for a good education. You can work your way into a better job. You can confront your boss if you need to. You can build up your skills. You can negotiate for better work-life balance. You can blaze a new trail and you can save your records so that historians like me can make sure you get credit for all you do. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you so much. The students and teachers an opportunity to, to uh, type in their questions. What was it? Was there one thing in particular that you found out about Elizabeth, that you didn't know prior to starting your research for this book? I was really impressed by how much teamwork there was uh, between her and her husband and how much they work together. Often it's really hard to find the dividing line and between who did what, although you can go through the notes and you start to recognize all their handwriting and you can see what happens. And you can see how ambitious they were. And what I hadn't 
known until I read their love letters from World War II was how much her husband said, I want you to have a career too. That was so unusual. A hundred years ago, most marriages were based on the man had the career and the woman stayed at home. And here he was saying, no, you know, you have just as much right to a career as I do. And I think that was really important. It's really important to have a partner who supports you. You have to have the motivation and the grit to go after things yourself, but it's hard to make it work if you don't have that backup. So we got received a question from Cody. Did Elizabeth do code breaking after World War II? She did do a bit of code making more than code breaking. She worked for the IMF. They hired her as a consultant. I think they would have heard that she had done the code making for the OSS, that precursor to the CIA. They might have heard also she had written codes for the Treasury Department, and that would not have been such a secret. So the International Monetary Fund had to, to keep a lot of things secret at the time. Most of what they did was um, make sure currency rates were kept as closely guarded secrets anytime they changed. They helped regulate those. And if you knew that a country was about to devalue its currency, then as a speculator, you could come in and just make a huge amount of money off that, wreck the economy. And then it could cause worldwide in that, uh, financial chaos. So it was hugely important that she was able to set up stuff and it was never broken. So she, she did a really good job. She also spent time um, working with her husband on looking at Shakespeare again, the project that had brought them together. So she and her husband wrote the definitive book that proves there are no ciphers or codes in Shakespeare's first folio. So there is a book out there that they wrote together? There is. <laughs> yes. Uh, they spent, they were working on this project for quite a few years, and then they heard that there was a prize that was given uh, by a famous Shakespeare library in Washington, D.C., and they decided they were going to get it done. And so they did, and they both got sick. They went down with the flu, but they still got it in, and they got it done, and they won the prize. And the book, eventually, a sort of abbreviated version of that was published by Cambridge University Press, and they became a big deal. You know, they were covered in The New Yorker and things. They really loved it. But after that, at the time, the NSA was really worried about any code-breaking information going into the public. And so they said no more publications, which was really devastating to the Freedmans. Was Elizabeth the only one that worked with the Coast Guard with all that rum running, et cetera? Or did she, did she meet a group of, of code-breakers? I guess, so, you know, was she solo or did she actually manage some folks to, to do the work they did for the Coast Guard? She did a little bit of work on her own in um, late 1925 and early 1926. She took some time off to have her son. And then when she came back from 1927 to 1931, it really was just her. Occasionally, her husband would, you know, take a look at something she brought home in part just because some of the messages from the run runners were really funny. Um, (laughs) But Almost all of it she did herself. She had a secretary who helped file things but had no clue about how to do code breaking. Then in 1931, she puts up a proposal to hire a whole unit that she wants to hire and train people. And she says it'll actually save the Coast Guard money because they're spending so much money on fuel, zipping around trying to find rum runners, uh, that she shows how she's been able to break code so they can go right to the handoff point. And so she says in fuel alone, you will make back the money really fast. And they bite and they say, okay, you can have the money and you can hire people. She wanted to hire women, but you had to hire from the civil service list and women weren't taking the exams then. So she hired men and and yes, trained them from scratch. And most of them were still with her in World War II. You talked about uh, or the way that you you organized your talk for today was looking at Elizabeth's life and the things that she learned as far as then what we can then learn. What do you think? And she had two children. One, of course, was her was a daughter and a son. I guess two questions. 
So one is those lessons that you had talked about that, you know, that she wanted to work about work life balance, et cetera. Did they at the time just apply to her or was she basically, was she able to help other women that were working in other locations that were becoming code breakers? Right. And then did either of her children go into any cryptology or, you know, now what we know as cyber work? Our children didn't go into code breaking. She wasn't even able to train other women in code breaking because they just were never, there were very few of them and they weren't assigned to a unit. It kind of depended on when the vacancy came up and who was on the civil service exam list. So I think, you know, she she was an inspiration to some of them. They would hear about her. Sometimes they met her uh, during World War II. Some of them uh, worked for her husband. Her husband did hire women. Some of the the women who became the leaders of the next generation were hired by her husband and they would come over for dinner. Uh, And so they would meet her there and and she was a legend to them. I think that um, she really had another legacy though that she also did work with the League of Women Voters back at a time when that was really new. I mean, women had only just gotten the vote. And Elizabeth wasn't interested in women getting the vote at the time it happened. She really thought, you know, well, women can be pushy too. And so, you know, I don't know how much this matters. But then she gets into the situation where, you know, she can't go to the front. She gets hired as her husband's assistant at his pay. And it's around that time she becomes really interested in women's rights and women's ability to work. And so she works on campaigns that are there to protect the rights of employed women. She also works on D.C. statehood, which is another one of her because she lived in D.C. and she was really frustrated that they didn't have representation. So, but yeah, she did work on women's employment issues. She did so much and she's such a like important historical figure. One of our questions, and this was also one of mine, you know, Alan Turning got a movie. Is Elizabeth, you know, going to get a movie in Hollywood now that her story is coming out? I mean, it's there are so many different angles. I mean, even a TV series, I feel like, would be exciting. What do you think? Well, I certainly would be excited to, to see that, too. So we'll see. Um, I think there is interest. So let's keep our fingers crossed. I think it would be really wonderful to see just there's a way sometimes when people say, you know, Elizabeth is the Alan Turing, which it doesn't quite work because the, the kind of work that Turing did in terms of, you know, these totally innovative ways of using machines to break codes, that was, it was a different thing, but that's what part of what's important about code breaking. It takes many different kinds of skills, many different kinds of brains, and it's having all those different people with their different ways of looking things you know, looking at the problem, you need all of those different skills. So sometimes, you know, that can miss the point. But in terms of excitement, I honestly think, especially once you have the mobsters in, it's an even better movie. Than- For sure. <laughs> I just want to interject one thing, and Amy was a part of this as well, is that PBS did actually do one of their American Experience programs on Elizabeth earlier this year, and Amy actually is in that as well. So we're getting there. That was just one program about her, but you guys are right that she deserves her own. There's some other things in the works. I'm sworn to secrecy about them right now. (laughs) (laughs) But there are some other things in the works. You know, you never know what will come to full fruition. But I think people are interested now. They can really see that this is somebody who should get uh, top billing, really. You know, such a fascinating life and such important service. And both she and her husband had such a strong sense of duty. Um, They also had a great sense of fun. They used to write um, various codes and ciphers for dinner parties and organize just uh, kind of the the craziest events that were all around their love for code breaking. Do we have some examples of what types of codes she broke other than maybe Enigma or even codes that she created? Like our could maybe f- some of our students and viewers out there be familiar with anything that she's done? Probably not, because at 
most of the the old code making um, is gone and a lot of the records on that we just don't have much anymore but we do know that she set up several systems for the OSS from World War II, the, the spy agency. One of the things that she used was a one-time pad system. Now, Germany was working with those. Russia quite famously was working with them. That's part of what the Venona project was investigating. William and the army, he was working for the army through his whole career. They investigated those as well, but when Elizabeth did that, I mean, it, it was state of the art, as she said much later, she couldn't comment too much about that. But she makes this one throwaway comment in an interview where she said, I use the one unbreakable system. It's amazing that there is just one system like that. And I was like, one time pad. And then I did some more digging and I finally found some confirmation. Yes, she set up a one time pad system, but you had to like be able to connect the dots, all these tiny fragments, but that's what she did. So if you look into that, you know, that's a fun one to look at. And then in terms of all the stuff she was doing, a lot of the work that she did during the, the Coast Guard was in cipher code. And she was working a lot with, um, after that, there were uh, opium cases, uh, opium smuggling rings, and those often had a leg that was based in Asia. And so she was working with Asian language and ciphered code. And she was frustrated during World War II because she felt that she wasn't, the Enigma was a challenge, but she needed more challenges of that caliber. And she had broken the spy rings by January 44. So she kind of spent a year just twiddling her. And one of the things I see she would have really loved to do is Japanese native codes. They should have put her on that because she had the expertise. She had far more expertise than just about anybody in the States at that time. So yes, I got, at first I wondered why is she frustrated when she did all this? But the more I looked at the code breaking, there is on archive.org, you can find a history of unit 387 in the Elizabeth Friedman collection. And if you look at that, it's an example of how they broke the first example of every single kind of code they ran into in World War II. That is wonderful. Oh, wow. You want to understand kind of line by line how she did it. That's the place to look at. It's just a terrific resource. You can see how she broke the Enigma messages. You can see the stupid mistake that the German spies make and how she was able to exploit it. Wow. And that website again was our at archive.org. And if you look up the Elizabeth Smith Friedman, you'll get to a co collection of documents. And in that will be the history of Unit 387. And you can look at just page by page. Anybody can look at it and you can see That's super what cool. they did. It was declassified in the early 2000s. And otherwise, you know, for more than 50 years, it just sat there. But that's the, the proof of what her unit was doing. That's fabulous. And I, I do want to mention, because I'm excited. So on the 26th, Amy's book about Elizabeth will be um, available, which is called The Women All Spice Fear. And it's a young adult nonfiction book. And so I just want to mention that to the students and teachers as well, that that to look for that next week. <laughs> that's right yes i just got my copy i don't know if it'll come the right Ooh. way but it's so pretty it uh, is pretty. Yeah, so, and there is a hidden cipher in it so oh fun okay yeah so i don't know i you know <laughs> do we have any I, more I questions probably somebody will be able to break it but if you go to my website you can put in what you think the message is and it'll lead you to something uh that's fun well, if there's no more for the Q&A and the chat, we want to thank Amy Butler Greenfield for being here today and sharing her awesome storytelling skills. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Be sure to check out our book, The Woman All Spies Fear. All right. Thanks, Amy. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.